And now I'm going to present the speaker of Vendor Risk Management for Beginners, Christina Liu. Yes, hello. My name is Christina Liu. Um, a little quick, who am I? Again, Christina Liu, pronouns she, her. I am an enterprise security engineer at Cisco Meraki. My Twitter handle is Kuthulu, if you want to find me there. Um, I also recently adopted a corgi like three and a half weeks ago, so he will be the subject matter of all the slides today. If you want to follow him on Instagram, shadow the rescue corgi. So vendor risk management, what is it? Essentially, we are measuring the risk associated with integrating or sharing company or organization data with a third-party vendor. So examples of third-party vendors are apps like Slack, uh, services like AWS, GitHub. Essentially, if you don't work at those companies and if you're sharing your data with them, they are a third-party vendor. After you measure the risk, oh, slides, um, you're, you will determine uh, or your organization will determine if the risk is acceptable for the company to share data with. So for the risk, maybe installing a sketchy dog emoji counting Slack app might not be worth the risk, but installing Slack itself is worth the risk. Now, after that, or before that, you have to consider and think about what mitigations or security controls need to happen before vendor integration. Essentially, you're trying to answer the question of what do we need to do um, to enable the teams to use this vendor with as little risk to your organization as possible. Now, why is this important? Well, data breaches are bad. Um, data breaches can happen from internal security control misconfigurations, but data breaches can also happen if your vendor does not keep your data safe. Like, it really sucks to have a data breach from your internal organization, but it sucks even more if a vendor, because you're paying them money, uh, creates a problem for you. Also, certain compliance standards require third-party uh, third risk management programs. And if your organization is going to be trying to go for these certifications, it's good to get the um, process started now, then later. And for risk management programs, they will look different across different companies depending on lots of factors, like the size of your company, the maturity of your company, are you a startup, are you an established company, and also just how mature your organization's security program is. So here's six things to consider while doing third-party uh, vendor review. First, authority of the requester. Essentially, does this person requesting this app have the authority to sign and pay for potential contracts? If the requester doesn't have the authority, check with someone that does. You don't want to waste your time reviewing an app that even their team lead wouldn't okay. And due to data restrictions, you might have to purchase the enterprise version because the free version might not cut it. The enterprise version come, usually comes with things like logging, integration to SSO, or um, multi-factor authentication. So due to compliance restrictions, you might have no choice but to go with an enterprise version. And also, when you find an app owner, uh, this is the person you contact in case of emergencies or incidents due to this application. And the app owner is usually like a senior manager, director, or like human with purchasing powder, is it? Powder, power, essentially. And in a small organization, this person can be simply like the person with the credit card. In a larger organization, You'll want to work with your finance, procurement, or legal team to find this person if it's kind of tricky. And you'll actually be working very closely with these teams because if legal doesn't okay the contract, the vendor doesn't get onboarded. If finance doesn't pay them, the vendor won't get onboarded. Well, the vendor won't let you use their service. <laughs> now, the next one is data classification. Essentially, you're thinking about what, what types of data are important. Important, and you have to then rank that data based on sensitivity. So to give you an idea of types of sensitive data is PII, which is personally identifiable information. This is information that allows uh, somebody to identify another human being. 
HIPAA data, which is healthcare data with PII. So this is like medical records, treatments, that sort of stuff. GDPR stuff, this is a legal framework that you need to abide by. PCI, which is a credit card compliance um, program. Uh, essentially, you have to keep credit cards safe. And now, these uh, compliance programs, you have to keep this data safe because there are severe uh, financial fines if you don't handle that data correctly. And even some of them, I believe HIPAA, come with jail time if you don't properly handle that data. So, and not only do you need to keep like data like this safe, there are, are data that will affect the public perception of your company if you do not keep it safe. So information like active sales lead data, you do not want your competitor knowing what your sales team is doing and who they're trying to go for for contracts. Intellectual property, you don't want your source code getting out. And other things like unreleased features and products, like it doesn't look good if information like this is leaked. And most likely you'll need to work with a legal team to create a data matrix. A data matrix is essentially uh, buckets for you to put types of data into. So you'll be ranking data into something like, is this data considered public, confidential, highly confidential, restricted data? And with the data matrix, you can determine how thorough of a review you need to do in order to determine the risk of the app. So for example, confidential apps might just require a scan, whereas restricted apps may trigger a pen test. And if your company has a privacy and ethics team or a privacy and ethics advocate, they should be in on this conversation as well because privacy is an incredibly fast evolving sector. And what, what might be just like best practices now could actually become law in the next few years. Next is implementation review. Essentially, you are speaking with the team that wants to use this app. You're trying to determine what other systems this app may be connecting to as well. We are living in an age where everyone has a dashboard and everyone loves integrations. So you wanna make sure that any other apps that you're integrating to also um, has a risk, risk score. Another thing that you'll be doing with Teams is data diagram reviews. You'll want to take a look at how this team plans on implementing uh, our data with this vendor. You may need to review API object calls for, to make sure that like sensitive data isn't being unwittingly passed. You may want to review SQL queries to make sure no sensitive data is being unduly passed. Uh, another thing that you'll want to do is threat model with the team. Um, this is a, I like this part a lot because it's a good way to get other folks involved in the security process. I like to ask people to put on their hacker hats and ask them if you are, if you are going to hack this, how would you do it? It's their system. They should know. Um, and after that, then you can ask them, so what is the implication or the impact of this attack? Sometimes you know the answer, but sometimes you get surprised by what the team creates. And after that, you can ask, what mitigating controls do we have? So do we have any controls down the chain to reduce the impact of the attack? And a bonus part for this one is people usually start thinking about threat modeling in other parts of their lives when they start doing this. And good for you, because you're basically doing a threat model inception to get people more security aware. You're going to have conversations with almost every team in the organization. And because of this, you're going to need to be able to speak to both engineers and what I like to call the run the business team. So everyone that's not engineering, sales, marketing, HR, recruiting, everybody. To, and you have to be able to clearly tell them uh, what they need to do to make sure that they're reducing the risk for the company. And because of this, you become a security influencer in your organization. People are going to start to come to you for just random security questions, which is kind of nice. I mean, you're essentially the character in Zelda where he says, you know, it's dangerous to go alone, take this. And the this that you are giving to people is a report with remediations, a risk score, and recommendations. Which then leads me to 
documentations and reports. So this is the stuff that you need from the vendor in order to do this review. Um, I like the Cake Light questionnaire. The, uh, the Cake Light questionnaire is a 70-ish question questionnaire that you send to the vendor. It's a self-assessment. They answer questions like, do they internally use MFA? Is their network segmented? Just all those questions like that. Of things you might want that you definitely want to look at if they have them is any sort of like industry certifications or compliance certifications. So things like PCI, SOC 2, HIPAA, FedRAMP. If they got it, you want it. You want to take a look at their pen test executive summary to take a look at what vulnerabilities they have in terms of like the highs, mediums, and lows. If they have any bug bounty programs, you want to like see that stuff. Essentially, you want to see anything that can give you a clearer picture of the vendor security posture so that you can more accurately assess the risk um, that they're, they're bringing to the company. And a note about the industry certifications, they're not green lights on their own, but if a vendor has these, the risk does go down because they have to be essentially audited every year in order to maintain certifications. And at the end of the review, you produce the risk score. And now a risk score can be something as official as like a report with the score and your recommendations, exactly what documents you reviewed. Or if your company is smaller and you don't need something so heavyweight, it could just be a JIRA ticket that says like in securities opinion, we assess the vendor to be of low, medium, high, very high risk. I reviewed these things. And for the risk score, it's not security or approving or denying this app. We're just giving an opinion of risk. By producing this measurement, um, it is now up to the requester or upper management to then decide if they want to accept the risk, change the use case, or just deny the, deny the vendor, which leads to risk acceptance, remediation, reassessment. And we have to do risk acceptance because sometimes high risk is worth it. And leadership said so. Sometimes sales contracts rely on high risk applications or new features will rely on high risk applications. I mean, leadership has information that you're not privy to, so they get to make that decision. And if compromises need to be made, then managers and other leaders are consciously accepting that risk. You want to get that risk acceptance in writing. You want to email that risk report to them and get them to acknowledge that they have read the risk report and are accepting the risk. And you can do it in email or a JIRA ticket or whatever work tracking process you have. And what this also does is it establishes a contact person in case of an incident. They're going to be the point of contact. For, for mediation, uh, you'll want to do some vendor outreach. Essentially, when you get their pen test report, they're going to be, there are going to be vulnerabilities on there. You want to ask the vendor, did you remediate these things? Um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. If they did remediate their medium size, then their risk score goes down. If they didn't remediate, then the risk score stays the same or goes up. And vendors should all be reassessed on a regular schedule to ensure that they maintain high security and compliance standards. Also, as time goes on, teams grow, teams change, and the use case for using that vendor may change. So for example, there could be an app that the sales team is using. Now recruiting wants to use it. Well, with recruiting data comes people's personal information data, their home data, and things like that. And because of that, the data classification for that vendor could go up to something that was once confidential to like highly confidential based on a change of use case. And a good way to track this and when to reassess data is to put it on a schedule based on data classification. So remember in the beginning, when we talked about that data matrix, that um, the buckets of the like public, confidential, highly confidential data. So maybe things like maybe apps that are classified as public or confidential, maybe they only need to be reassessed every three years. Um, but like highly confidential and uh, restricted apps, maybe they need to be reassessed every single year. So you then need to go back to the vendor and say, hey, can you send me updated security and compliance reports for the most current year? And lastly, don't reinvent 
the wheel. Um, risk management has been around for a while now, so people have established processes for this. Um, if you need to go for compliance standards, you may want to take a look at the NIST framework. It's very complete, it's very large. Do with it what you will. Um, the Again, the questionnaire that I like to use is called CAKE, which stands for Consensus Assessments Initiative Questionnaire. It's 70 questions. It's relatively short and sweet. You don't have to write your own questions. I like it. I use it. And if you are a subsidiary in like a larger organization, check out what the parent organization might have for you and see if you can like piggyback on any of their processes or any of their tooling. Also, Larger organizations might have subscriptions to scanners and other third-party assessors for you to use. So maybe for apps that are ranked as like public and confidential, maybe all you have to do is send them to a third-party risk assessor, and that's good enough for you. So and I, examples of some third-party risk assessors are like Security Scorecard or CyberGRX. And how to get this job? Well. Look out for job titles that say like enterprise security engineer, vendor review and program management, uh, risk review manager, anything that says like enterprise risk and review. Like look out for those. Um, and this is some of the types of experience that really helps to do this work. So if you have any sort of dev experience, super useful because you will be reviewing code at some point. You're going to look at, you know, queries, uh, JSON objects, JavaScript snippets, and snippets of just like other code. You're going to be doing a lot of threat modeling. If you are not good at threat modeling yet, get good at it. I highly recommend checking out the stride model for threat modeling. If you are very good at not navigating documentation to find the exact thing you need, you'll be good at this. I've literally had to comb through 40 page reviews looking for a section that says like, um, the auditor attests that the system performs in the way as expected in a 40 page review or document. You need to have strong communication skills. Again, you may be the very first security contact point for these teams ever. So you will be doing a lot of security education for people that aren't already security conscious and security aware. So you're going to be going to basics a lot of the time. And this area of security benefits from someone with a vast array of skills from different areas of the company and different industries because you're, you're reviewing apps for everyone, right? Like you're going to be reviewing apps for potentially for an engineering org or your engineering department where you're reviewing like Jenkins and other build pipeline tools to things like Donut, which is a, 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 a casual three-person meeting app. So, oh, that's it. Wow. I went, I went fast. It's time for questions. I think there's a microphone that they're going to hand to you. Yeah. Or if you just say the question, I can repeat it. Loud. You can be loud, and I'll repeat it for people on the, the internet. So, what do you suggest for people who reach out to vendors and ask for documentation and like their job security and they're like, no, we're not security? Ooh, uh, the question is what do you do when you reach out to a vendor for their compliance certifications like SOC 2 and they don't give it to you? Um, I've not had that happen <laughs> because because the contracts I think like we go with are usually larger and, and bigger. But I think what you could do potentially is I feel like sales really wants this contract. So we'll probably they'll probably do it. Um, and then it might help to talk to legal to see like, hey, if we sign this NDA, will you send us the information then? So I can try that. Because I think a lot of times it's just like they're worried about protecting their own data, rightfully so. Any other questions? These two, okay. Yeah. 
Are there any cases where you would not do this sort of security review when dealing with a cloud vendor? What was the question? Are there any are there any cases where you would not do a security review when dealing with a cloud vendor? Where you feel you don't have to? It, it, I think it also data classification. I think is a good one. Um, like if you have a, a like if it's just all public data, like you really don't need to do a thorough review on it. Also, I mean, it's it's essentially like the questions to answer really is, are you sending any priority, uh, proprietary data or, or confidential data from your company or your organization to the third party vendor? And are they going to be storing, transmitting, processing, or yeah, any of that data? So if they're not doing that, then probably not. It's hard to say definitively without looking at the actual case. Question, how do you best manage vendors when, let's say, the points of contact who are managing that uh, relationship, they may change roles or maybe uh, they didn't actually share with the new leader that, um, that, they, that they were managing this, this uh, with, contract or this app? Is this within the organization or on yeah, the vendor within the, side? Within, within the organization. Or, or vice versa, even on the vendor side. I mean, usually the vendor side, um, like if someone from the organization reaches out being like, hey, we want to renew the contract, so a salesperson gets on that real quick. Um, but with internal within the organization, Kind of figures itself out. They're usually, <laughs> ideally, what you'd want to do is have like a list, an inventory of like apps and vendors that you have, yeah. and make sure like the point of contact is updated on that. And again, remember the point of contact is like usually a senior manager. If you're, if you know, in a perfect world, the point of contact is a senior manager or director. Um, and if that person is no longer there, I would just assume it goes to another senior manager yeah. or a director. It becomes their problem. No worries, no worries. <laughs> I have a follow-up question if there's no one else. What if a company gets breached? One of your vendors. Oh, the company gets breached. Um, well, I would think, one, the person who's listed as the point of contact for there would be... Uh, like the first point of contact. And again, if, if your company has something like, um, like a DNR role or like a detection and response or things like that, that person would be working very closely with the people that handle the data incidents and, and breaches. And if your organization doesn't have those people, think about who would be that person and maybe establish some processes and think about a what if, like if there was a data breach what information do we have, or how can we audit what happened to this data breach and have someone responsible for that or maybe make a playbook? Question. Um, when you were talking about assessing the risk for a potential vendor, you also take into account whether they are disclosing vulnerabilities, if they are publishing vulnerability information. So should... Um, Got their customer data may be compromised. Mm -hmm. uh, an organization can take remediating action to determine whether or not the vulnerability uh, compromised the data hosted uh, in the. Can you ask that louder? I can't yeah. hear you. Yeah, I was saying when you are assessing the risk for a potential vendor, do you also take into account in your evaluation whether they are providing vulnerability information mm -hmm. publicly so they yeah. disclose the yeah. vulnerabilities? If, yeah, like if, sometimes you could just do a quick Google and see like, you know, if they've like remediated from big, big security things, like like for Log4j, right? Like that was a big deal. And you might want to do a quick Google of like, hey, like did this vendor make a statement about Log4j? If they did, and they're saying that they're doing all these things to fix it, then like the risk is lower because they're doing things about it. If not, then the risk can go up and you could just ask your salesperson about like, hey, like Log4j, were you affected by that? Sometimes they answer, sometimes they don't. And if they don't answer, risk score goes up. <laughs> they answer, risk score can go down. Yeah. Does anybody else have a question? 
Thank you, Christina. Okay. Bye.